Alors, bonjour. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. We'll get started slowly. Things are always a little slower on Friday mornings. Alors, bienvenue. Euh, mon nom est Marie-Ève Sylvestre. Je suis la doyenne de la section de droit civil ici à l'Université d'Ottawa et j'ai le plaisir d'être votre modératrice pour cette deuxième journée du sommet de la recherche des académies du G7 sur la science, la confiance et la démocratie à l'ère du numérique, un événement qui est organisé en partenariat avec la Société royale du Canada, l'Ambassade de France et l'Université d'Ottawa. Donc, un grand merci à tous ces partenaires. La journée d'hier a été un véritable succès. Elle euh, s'est terminée d'ailleurs en beauté euh, à l'Ambassade de France. Before we get started this morning, please allow me to pay my respect to the Anishinaabe people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Alors, inspiré par cet héritage autochtone, la deuxième journée du symposium va justement être amorcée sur le thème de la diversité des sources de savoir et de connaissances. We will start with a presentation by Chief Ronald Ignis and Dr. Marian Ignis, who I will have the pleasure to introduce in a few minutes. Nous nous tournerons ensuite vers l'avenir avec une table ronde qui propose un dialogue intergénérationnel sur les conséquences de l'intelligence artificielle sur l'avenir du monde du travail. Ensuite, nous céderons la parole à euh, Mona Nemer, scientifique en chef du Canada, qui nous proposera un bilan et quelques réflexions sur euh, la science et la société, et en particulier sur notre relation par rapport euh, à la technologie. Et j'inviterai finalement le président de la Société royale du Canada, Chad Gaffield, à prononcer un mot de clôture. A few housekeeping announcements before we start this morning. A reminder that French to English and English to French simultaneous translation is available throughout the conference and that you can get uh, headphones in the back. Alors, nous avons des interprètes présents sur les lieux pour la traduction français-anglais. Et um, donc, on vous invite à aller chercher uh, vos écouteurs uh, à, à l'autre bout de la salle. We will also have a question period uh, after each of the presentation, which I'll be moderating. Um, donc, nous allons avoir une période de questions et vos questions pourront être posées ou bien uh, au microphone ou encore à travers notre système Slido. You have all the information about Slido on the back of your badge, and I think uh, this information was also provided to you earlier. So without further ado, uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing this morning Chief Ronald Ignis and Dr. Marian Ignis, both professors at Simon Fraser University. Chief Ronald Ignis is a member of the Sequapec Nation. He's been the elected chief of the Sikches Band for more than 26 years since the early 1980s, and also serve as chairman of the Shushwap Nation Tribal Council and president of the Shekwekbek Cultural Education Society during the late 1980s and 1990s, co-facilitating the repatriation of human remains from the Royal BC Museum. He holds a BA and an MA in sociology from the University of British Columbia and completed his PhD in anthropology at Simon Fraser University in 2008 with a dissertation title, Our Oral Histories or Our Iron Post. Sequapec Stories and Historical Consciousness. He has published and co-published with Marian Ignes several articles and book chapters on Sequapec history, ethnobotany, and language and culture. Élevé par ses arrière grands parents Ron Ignes parle couramment le Sequapecin et a plus de 60 ans d'expérience pratique dans la cueillette des, al des aliments traditionnels Sequapec grâce aux compétences qu'il a acquises de ses propres aînés qui ont partagé avec lui leurs histoires et les enseignements dans cette langue. Dr. Marian Ignis is a professor of linguistic and First Nation studies at Simon Fraser University and director of uh, SFU First Nation Languages Program and Research Center. Her publications include The Curtain Within, Ida Social and Symbolic Discourse, co-author with Margaret Anderson, and books on indigenous language planning and curriculum development for First Nation education steering committees. Based on many years of studies in Sequapec ethnobotany and ethnoecology, she edited and wrote with Nancy Turner and Sandra Peacock 
Sequoquic People and Plants Research Paper on Sushwap Ethnobotany. Une résidente de la communauté Sequoic de la nation Sequoic, elle enseigne et coordonne actuellement des cours de langue autochtone à Kamloops, à Aïda euh, Gwai et au Yukon et dirige un partenariat du CRSH axé sur la documentation et la revitalisation linguistique des Premières Nations. Chief Ronald Ignes and, Marian, and Dr. Marian Ignes received the Governor General Award for Innovation in 2019. So please welcome them this morning. Bonjour, good morning. In our language, we greet each other with in the morning with, you made it through the night. <laughs> so I see you all made it through the night. Uh, John. Uh, <coughs> As a Schiem Stamko, who clodded commanders, as a Suchentels in Elia, as a Kunena Suskwena University of Ottawa, Jacques Fremont, I hope, in the Royal Society of Canada, Chad Garfield, in, I guess I should interpret. There's no interpreter. There's no channel for the Sukrat Machine. I'll, I'll, I'll forget. Uh, I would like to uh, honor and, uh, and, and uh, recognize uh, the people of this land uh, uh, and uh, as well as uh, honor and uh, Claudette Commander for uh, welcoming us into her homeland as well as uh, thank the University of uh, Ottawa and Jacques Fremont uh, and Royal Society of Canada, Chad Garfield, for having us here and we're honored to be in front of you today. Ashen Church, but Chuchkin Ashes, Sus Quin Yena de Kalmuch de Chiem, the Elian Tmich. I would also like to recognize the people of the land and also add our thanks to Pierre Corvel, Academie des Sciences Francaises. So the presentation that we are giving today uh, in theme is a bit different from many of the things we heard yesterday, but I think you will find and see the connections to the topics of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, the issues that were raised in conjunction with that yesterday. Um, so the subtitle that we have given it, it next to tapping into all sources of knowledge and culture is Sukhwapmuk Indigenous Perspectives on Language, Land, Laws and Knowledge. The place we are talking about, Sukhwap Mukhutluk, uh, is in the south central interior of British Columbia. That's the homeland of 10,000 years for the Sukhwap Muk people. And it's a very diverse territory with nine different biogeoclimatic zones. If you drive through it, perhaps on the way through Kamloops as you're going to the coast or going uh, east from there, you'll see the cactus and sagebrush and uh, fairly dry country, but it, uh, it changes as you go up the mountains. Oops, there we are. As is the custom before we go into our presentation, we would like to pay respect and uh, honor the many elders that over Ron's lifetime, in particular in the last 30 years as we've carried out uh, the research on the topic that we're presenting, have guided our knowledge seeking, have shared their wisdom and knowledge. Uh, the elders that you see in this collage here uh, are just a few. Uh, somebody actually, when uh, we published our recent work, Sukhwapmo People, Land and Laws, counted that there were 150 elders in it uh, whose words and uh, whose knowledge we cited. So, uh, but it's also a sign of the time in Sukhwapmo country, just like in other indigenous nations uh, throughout Canada and many other parts of the world. Most of the elders that you see in this collage here have left us uh, 
but exception with the exception of one, Christine Simon, who you see in the uh, Indian potato patch there in the middle. Uh, and with that also goes the wisdom of our languages. Sokwatmok uh, the Sokwatmok language, uh, once spoken by 10 to 15, 20,000 people we don't know, uh, is down to the last 75 or so first language speakers. And most of them are in their 80s, even 90s. So uh, we're in a... I was really fortunate uh, when I came to Sukhwat uh, in the mid-1980s that I uh, worked with the lady on the top right, uh, Selena Jules, who was the last monolingual speaker of Sukhwat Mokchin. And uh, in order to find out information from her, converse with her, I had to use the language. And we can't do that anymore because everybody speaks English. So, we want to honor all those elders. In the Sukhwatmuk way, uh, when we introduce ourselves, we don't actually introduce ourselves, we introduce one another. And uh, so you heard uh, the bio that uh, was kindly read just now, but we want to add a couple of things uh, to that. Uh, Ron was really fortunate uh, that he was uh, raised and adopted by his great-grandparents who uh, were born in the late 1870s. And uh, you see in the photograph on the uh, left there, the lady uh, who's holding uh, some firewood, uh, that was his great-grandmother, Sulien's mother, Cecile Melmanetqua, who was born in the 1830s, uh, just maybe 15, 20 years after the very first Europeans came into Sukhwamuk territory. And so in that sense of people being raised, raising one another, and uh, in terms of the uh, ways then that knowledge was shared, it really wasn't that long ago. Um, on, in the middle photograph, you see uh, the person second one from the left sitting with a fur hat. That's uh, Ron's great-grandfather, Heisen Sisyaskat, who was uh, initially a war chief among, among the Sukhwatmuk people, then became the uh, political chief in the early 1860s, and uh, lived through the time that the very first gold seekers were coming into the country, who then started driving cattle herds into Sukhwatmuk territory. And, uh, basically uh, overrunning the land. And uh, he was known for having torched the land to uh, try to preserve the uh, integrity of the territory of the Skechistan people. And, we uh, <clears throat> and uh, Marianne was born into a Frisian platoid speaking uh, community in Northwest Germany and uh, that she came over to Canada and lived in and was adopted into the Haida community at Masset uh, where she did her PhD research and, uh, and language documentation ever since and received her name Gulkichwet. That's it's a Haida word, I'm surprised I can pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, uh, she's lived uh, in Suhepam community for 30 years uh, and uh, up in the northern part of our territory before we met. And uh, she's uh, done research on Suhepam ecology, stories, and our languages and other topics. Uh, and uh, we've raised uh, our children and we try to raise them into Suhepam uh, Chin, the Suhepam language. And she is a director of a seven year. Uh, social Science and Humanities Research uh, Partnership Grant on Language Revitalization, and uh, that's been a slice. <laughs> <laughs> For Sukhwatmuk people, uh, when the ethno ethnographer James Tate, who uh, came to our territory in the early 1900s, uh, he asked uh, the elders at the time, what do you know about the first people on your land? 
the first human life. Uh, are there any memories of it? And at that time, uh, we have to remember, uh, archaeology was in its infancy, and uh, the, uh, neither settlers nor scientists had any idea about the actual time depth of Sequatmoc occupation and other indigenous peoples' occupation of the land. They thought, oh, maybe a couple thousand years or so. And uh, so the uh, Sequatmoc elders at the time said, well, our ancestors were the coyote people. They lived in a time of great heat, winds, and fire. And uh, at that time also, there was one or more huge floods that they survived, and uh, th those floods created some of the landscape as it exists right now. And it's really quite remarkable because we know now from science that that period was at the end of the last Cordilleran Ice Age when the glaciers melted and Sukhwatmokotlo became inhabitable, so about 10,000 years ago. And uh, a big cataclysmic event was the breaking of an ice dam uh, southwest of us uh, that uh, drained 25 cubic kilometers of water out of the glacial lakes within days probably. And you can still see the claw marks of that event in the landscape. And so those people had some collective memory to that time long time ago. And we also know from uh, paleoecology and uh, paleoclimatology that uh, it was about three, year, three degrees warmer in those 3,000 years or so, the, between 11,000 and uh, 7,500 years ago. So those ancestors experienced climate change. They lived through it all. They developed the resilience to uh, survive and thrive. And uh, it's something we have to keep in mind, but we also have to keep in mind that that collective memory stretches back a long, long time. Interesting. Um. Also, the, uh, at that time, the river flowed in the opposite direction than it does today. And that uh, cataclysmic break in the ice dam was committed to memory uh, via a story about how Coyote uh, had a hankering for fish. So he went down to, to look for the fish downstream and uh, in the process uh, broke the dam open and brought the salmon up to us. We want to tell you a little bit about, uh, if we, we could call it Sukhwatmok ontology and epistemology. Uh, we call it, call it a Stlachmemskuch et le Stlachamwilchs. Um, back in the 1990s, uh, one, one of our elders, uh, who is deceased now, uh, Nellie Taylor, uh, she gave us this statement long time ago, Sukhwatmok people looked after the land and all the animals and plants, everything in it. That's why they always had plenty to fish. They had deer to hunt and plants to gather for food and medicine, but they had to practice for it and learn about everything on the land first for a long time. Then they knew how to look after it. It was also important for the elders to share each other's knowledge. That was how they learned and built up their understanding. What knowledge they shared had to be exact. And perhaps this sounds fairly simple and innocuous to you, but there are actually some very important principles that she mentions here. First of all, gathering knowledge happens through experience and observation, and it is based on the cumulative prior experience of people. Secondly, sharing through communication and mutual validation of people, places, events, and deeds. So people shared knowledge to mutually validate it in the act of continuous communication. And that kind of knowledge was also around reciprocal and relational accountability among all sentient beings on the land, including humans. So it, it does not separate humans from the land itself and from the, the, the creatures, the beings, the animals, the plants, and the ancestral landscape that continuously speaks back to you. And finally, the way of uh, practicing involved the concept that we call etzchem. Uh, do you want to talk about etzchem? Uh, etzchem is uh, at a time that a, a young 
boy or girl uh, uh, reaches puberty and uh, they're taken out into the, the mountains and they're there to uh, practice certain skills and to, I guess, uh, to, to com uh, it's a way of, uh, we are a collective society and the idea was to take a person uh, and set them out when, you're, when your mind, uh, imagination is raging and you're out in the bush by yourself and little crack in the bush, your, your imagination just goes rampant. <laughs> but it, 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 it teaches you, uh, and you also get powers. You may get a song out there and you attain, uh, you, 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 you come in tune with the universe, the, the flux of the universe, and through there, you, uh, a portal opens and you get your song or a message from an ancestor or from an animal as to, and that will become your power and when you, in, in your, as you go along in your life you, and you run into trouble, uh, you, you, you turn to that power to help you through. And uh, it also, when you come back in, you recognize and see the significance of the collective society and you will do everything to defend and protect the collectivity of your society. It's an important training moment in one's life. There are also some important principles behind how we tschlochem uh, Our elders uh, use the English translation for tschlochem wilch as uh, how we come to our senses. Uh, and it describes, on the one hand, the uh, time sort of when children are about uh, five, six years old, when they have the first memories, co coherent memories that they can share and uh, to speak about uh, things they experience later on in life. Uh, but it, the, the word itself quite beautifully shows how coming to know is tied to our senses. The, term tlachem uh, includes the idea of clear-mindedness as, as an ongoing process of inquiry. And uh, our elders also talk of it as tlachem wilch ntmichskuch, coming to senses, to, to our senses on our land. So the notion of coming to our senses, coming to know, uh, is connected to land and to cumulative experience on the land of prior, prior people. And the land itself, Tmich, uh, is not just real estate, but uh, the term itself, which uh, incidentally exists in all 23 languages of the Salish language family. So it's a very ancient term. It means land, world, earth, nature, animal, spirit, and everything that's in it. So it uh, circumscribes that same sense of uh, land as being connected to humans and to all the beings in it and as a sent sentient kind of entity. We also want to share something about how our language guides us. Uh, we've talked about how this language is like other languages, indigenous languages uh, throughout North America is hanging by a thread. We have a mere 75 or so first language speakers left, but we do, we're doing our best to train new speakers and to create a new generation of those that are, will become and are becoming the language warriors and the torch bearers for the language. Um, but it also includes really important kinds of knowledge and wisdom like other indigenous languages, Sukhwatmukchin has built-in devices of grammar that help us keep track of how we observe, make sense of, and communicate what we know of our social and natural universe and its interactions and interrelations. And as you may know, linguists have pointed to this deep embedding of cognition, worldview, and culture in languages, each language expressing the genius, as it's been called, of a people's history and of being in place. And of course, it's a loss to humanity if, as is predicted, half of the 7,000 languages on Earth become extinct by the end of the 21st century. So some examples that we have of how in Sukhwatmukchin the language guides our thought 
is we have these grammatical devices uh, that linguists call evidentials. We tell one another what the ev evidential status of knowledge we report on is. Uh, is it personally experienced? And we use uh, one type of marking on a verb uh, that deals with that. Or is it knowledge that we know from hearsay because somebody has reported it? Or is it knowledge that we have concluded from evidence of our senses? So for example, if I say, uh, it means uh, Ron fixed his house. Uh, and the marking on the verb that I'm using means I was there and I saw it when he fixed his house. If I'm saying with the little suffix uka, I'm reporting something that I know from hearsay. Somebody told me that he'd fixed his house as the source of my knowledge. If I say with the suffix inka, that means uh, I know from uh, concluding from physical observation that he must have fixed his house. Maybe it, ha see it has a new roof, it has a new door, and it's not as dilapidated as it looked last week. So I'm concluding from my observation with the senses. Uh, and in English, we can say those things as well. Uh, we, we can say he must have fixed his house, or somebody says he fixed the house. It's, the difference is in Sukhwat Mokchin, every time we make a sentence, we need to mark the source of evidence. So it's a different kind of way. And some people have suggested if only in our courts we could have languages that use evidentials, maybe we would be further along on the path of determining evidence. When uh, I was doing some thinking and, and some research, and I was thinking, this uh, evidential seems to resonate with the, uh, the right-handed rule uh, that is understanding orientation of axis in a three-dimensional space. A second way in which the language relates to thought and experience uh, is in the way we use personal pronouns, but in particular, uh, the way we use the first person pronoun, the I. Uh, in Sukhwat Mokchin, we have to use a diminutive uh, of the verb or noun, if it's a my kind of thing, uh, which means it's a way of humbly speaking. So we continuously then maintain that rapport with the audience, with the people we're addressing, as expressing ourselves with humility, but lifting up those that we talk to. So it's a different way of interpersonally engaging and uh, showing what we've called earlier reciprocal accountability with those others around us. And uh, the reason that we do that is because we're a collective society, and you want to, and that's a, a a way to maintain harmony in your society. You don't challenge each other's, uh, I guess if you will, egos. Uh, and uh, so that's, a, that's an important component of our language. It's a law within our language that we, we can't do otherwise. One third example among many others is uh, the way that Sukhwat uh, Mokchin and other Salish languages uh, deploy lexical suffixes which are particles added to words that uh, describe the shape or the kind of something, if it's uh, stick-like, if it's round, uh, if it uh, is the shape of uh, any body part, a nose, a head, a belly. And so those kind of uh, suffixes uh, uh, inscribe the shapes of the human body into the landscape, uh, into geographic features, place names, and they, they provide very precise ways of uh, uh, defining anatomical terms of uh, hip joints and uh, different kinds of bones in the body and how they actually connect to one another. So it's, it's quite ingenious. Um, when discussing Sukhwat Mok history and the ways in which people relate to the land, and to one another. Uh, the late elder, Louisa Basel, uh, she used the term 
um, when she was uh, talking about rock paintings near her place, and when she was talking, she told uh, me at the time uh, some of our what we call transformer stories. They are narratives, often epic narratives, about uh, humans uh, long time ago that first made the land usable for subsequent generations that named the places and traveled on the land. And uh, she called this uh, including the place names also that are the markings of their deeds. And uh, what she meant by was, she said it in those terms, that's how they gave us the laws and uh, so, and at the same time, those laws mean the rights that Sukhwatmuk people have. And if you ask somebody nowadays, though, well, what does strai mean? It's the word for paper. Because uh, as those markings on the land, then, because they, they're considered as the deeds in a very similar term to how we use that in English, as deeds speak to the actions of past people, but deeds are also what gives us legitimacy to occupation of land in the Western fee simple way. In the title to your land. And, the, and of course, those, those were papers. That as uh, the ancestors in the late 1900s, when they were dispossessed from those very same papers by not being allowed to preempt land, uh, we're noticing. And those uh, different kinds of of laws given long time ago as deeds uh, revolve around the laws of ownership and trespass between nations. Uh, we have a spetek or narrative of coyote sitting on a rock and meeting the transformers that were coming into Sukhwatmuk territory from the outside. Uh, we've placed these narratives by comparing them with archeological information, the information from the history of Salish languages, paleoclimatology, at around, and archeology, span as hap having happened around 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. And so they first mark this existence of people as nations in relationship with one another. Secondly, Strei describes the laws of good conduct between people in those different nations uh, and uh, how people need to behave themselves, how they need to maintain good relations and be responsible, not just as individuals, but as members of groups. And uh, Strei also circumscribes laws of good conduct with and on the land. Uh, so it, uh, it's in what we could call an environmental ethic of reciprocal accountability and responsibility with the beings on the land from whom humans are not separate. And the narratives that lay out also tell us that there are consequences of reckless behavior that violates the principle of reciprocal accountability. Uh, as in a saying, the land and the sky will turn on, to, will turn on you. And finally, they, the, the narratives and the concepts behind them also tell us that humans cannot turn a blind, blind eye on recklessness, selfish and irresponsible behavior. Uh, we have the saying that so you can't just go like that and kind of pretend something isn't happening. And those might be some interesting lessons for us in this day and age. And Ron will tell us a few things about how this materializes uh, into the way people harvest resources on the land. Yeah, the, the way we look at uh, uh, when we go out uh, hunting or fishing, uh, we, we view the, the animals as an extension of us. There are par parts of our family that have uh, given themselves to us, will give themselves to us. Uh, we, we as a human beings are kunkwant, pitiful. And it's the animals that take pity on us and provide for us so that we can uh, thrive and survive. And it's a, and 
we have a story in which uh, uh, there was a, a meeting of all of, of, of all humans in the universe, and they couldn't decide who would be the caretaker of the of the land. And, and the rock saw an, a human standing, an old man standing on the side, and calls him over and asks him, "Will you be the caretaker of the land?" And he said, "Give me four days to think it over." And four days he thought over, and he came back and he said, "Yes." So we were chosen to be caretakers of all things on the land. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, and, uh, and this is when we, uh, we, uh, when we go hunting the animals, uh, we have a word for it, they kuchmanchut. You don't, you're not lucky. There's no such thing as luck in, in, in our way. If, uh, uh, if you, you get skunked, you get to oi, it's because the animal hadn't you had not uh, done your hunt respectfully, and that the animal, it wasn't the animal's time to give itself to you. Uh, I know I've, out in the bush, a uh, big rifle, 75 yards away, five shots, the moose just smiled and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also have what uh, ethnoecologists call kin-centric concepts of environmental relations. So uh, the late Laura Harry from Esket, uh, she uh, reminded us that uh, we're Koselknaus with the beings on the land, we're relatives to one another. And she had a beautiful way of putting it uh, with regards to salmon. Uh, she called it the salmon are our first children. So we have the responsibility of ensuring that they live, that they uh, uh, survive, and uh, that we keep the environment intact for them as our children, just like how we look after our children. And uh, the term that uh, I just mentioned in talking about the laws, I think it's an important one uh, because it considers the land, the sky, and earth, and water as sentient beings. Uh, so we say, you offend the land when you do something that you're not supposed to be doing. And as a consequence, uh, the land, the sky will turn on you uh, if you recklessly waste resources and don't look after the land. And uh, this is one way in which we can conceptualize uh, what amounts to Sukhwapmuk ecological knowledge and wisdom. Uh, this is a chart that uh, with our colleague uh, Nancy Turner uh, initially about 20 years ago we developed and then kind of fine-tuned over the years. Uh, it has at its core the philosophy and worldview uh, that's behind the knowledge about the land and then includes a number of uh, ways of practicing practical strategies of uh, stewarding and caretaking the land, its plants and animals, and also acts of communication and exchange of knowledge. And it's not just a circle, but it's actually a spiral. Uh, I was, uh, came across uh, the, the idea that uh, indigenous people lived in a sacred circle, uh, but, uh, and uh, I looked at it very carefully, and if you put your finger in a circle, and you go around, you wind up back to where you started from. And to me, that was a, 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 a historical and a cultural way of looking at us. And, and as a matter of fact, there was a time when they spoke about indigenous people as a people without history. And if you look, you characterize uh, the, uh, Western history, it's lineal, it's unilineal. And, uh, as well, uh, and so, so is uh, in the circle. I looked at both of them and they were mis the circle was a misrepresentation of us. And the synthesis that I came up with was they misunderstood the, the, the spiral in this part of the circle for, that forms the spiral is actually a spiral. So we have a, a multi-dimensional uh, view of the universe as opposed to uh, 
a unidimensional view, uh, as, would, as it would be in the circle or in the unilineal history of Western society. And those multidimensional ways of cumulative wisdom, uh, they exist in artifacts sometimes. Um, we, um, some of it is in our stories. Uh, the spectacle and story perhaps is not even a good word. Oral histories, oral traditions is a much better word. word. Uh, we, we learned uh, from studying uh, the uh, epic narrative of one of our transformers, Tlisa, where he, uh, to shield himself against a uh, huge rabbit that kills people, uh, by wearing a mica shield. And uh, the uh, types of, uh, in English we call it uh, supernatural uh, kind of beings that uh, were out to harm people, uh, perhaps uh, had types of energies that people even in those days sensed. Mica, of course, is an anti-conductor. It disrupts the flow of electric currents without doubt in some ways related to those acts of uh, transforming, of changing. Um, some of these items here, that they're actually in the American Museum of Natural History where we paid a visit last January uh, in uh, the process of uh, bringing home the remains of uh, 18 ancestors that were taken from uh, the Kamloops uh, First Nation in, in Sukhwapmuk territory in the late 1800s. And the archaeologist uh, who took those remains that have sat in the uh, American Museum of Natural History ever since also took grave goods, funerary objects uh, that were buried with them. Uh, and uh, among those, uh, in a couple of the uh, graves were pieces of galena. And you would think, well, why, why did they have galena, which is 80% lead, uh, as something that they gave on the journey to their deceased loved ones in those days. Uh, and galena, of course, is a mineral like, like being lead that bounces back uh, rays. And just like we use it when we go to a dentist and they have us wear the, uh, lead, uh, the uh, vest of lead. So th th there's something there that they knew these many years ago that those minerals had, had powers. Hmm? Uh, as my uh, great grandmother that raised me, she said uh, when you go to a different people's uh, land, you, 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 you give recognition and you be re very respectful because you never know who is in the room. They might have powers that they can cause you great harm with. And so we would use, uh, you know, mica or galena to protect ourselves in the event that we, we do get hit uh, with some uh, harmful powers. And most of all, in all these objects of everyday life, there is art. Uh, if you take a close look at the objects around the margins here, a pipe that has the figures of transforming uh, animals uh, and uh, a uh, sitting rock figure uh, that young girls after their puberty training used uh, to uh, be anointed with water. Uh, the, the one on the left, I don't know if anybody can guess what that might be. It's not a pipe. It's what the ethnographer James Tate called a conduit, which was a way, uh, it's a catheter. Uh, we invented to, years to, <laughs> to, uh, that was put into uh, and attached to uh, babies uh, gotcha. when they were in their uh, cradle boards or uh, in their birch bark, uh, bark cradles as a way to save on diaper moss. And each of them is finely incised with markings of the spirit journeys of the parents, of the ancestors, and of the children. We also find these uh, ways in which people talk to and of the land and the ways in which they're interrelated in our those oral narratives. 
Uh, this one here uh, speaks to uh, a woman who lives by herself by a lake. She makes herself a child because she's lonely, uh, who then finds herself a trout husband and goes under the lake with him where she uh, meets the trout family and uh, they're half human beings, half animals, and then they have children who make it back to land to visit their grandmother and uh, the grandmother tells the, uh, uh, dumps medicine over them to turn them back into humans and uh, only half hits the girl who's kind of shy and hanging back so she becomes a puppy and she tells the boy, don't ever spank your little sister uh, or your, 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 uh, your puppy. Uh, she doesn't tell him that's his sister, but he does one time and she transforms into a bird and flies off into the sky and he loses his only sister. Uh, then he climbs up into the sky world following an arrow that he's shot up and uh, meets his grandfather uh, who teaches him to uh, hunt and he actually got stuck there a long time ago as a young man when he was doing the same thing, chasing after an arrow. But he lends the young boy his skin as a way to give him his power and, uh, and to hide from the people who live in the sky world. Although eventually with the powers of his grandfather to be a good hunter, he wins uh, the chief's daughter as a wife and then uh, goes hunting with his brothers-in-law. And the brothers-in-law um, eventually cut his, uh, his skin to fully reintegrate him into their society. And uh, the skin floats away as the fog that you now see in the mountains. So stories like that can teach us many different kinds of lessons about the interconnectedness. Uh, they speak to the interconnection of our grasslands, the lake, the sky, the earth, as nourishing the livelihood of our peoples. They speak of the connections in the realm of humans, fish, animals, birds, plants, as being reciprocally accountable and mutually transformable. Uh, and specific species of animals and plants actually are what live in that environment. Many of them are endangered now. And the story also addresses the relationship between generations of grandmother and daughter, the grandchildren, the grandfather, giving spirit power to the grandson and sharing his skills. As well as nation -to -nation relations. And it speaks to the interrelationship of nations, other different kinds of people between the lake world, the sky world, and the world on the earth. And uh, it speaks to the uh, water cycle as uh, the water, the land, the atmosphere, all being in a connection and a reciprocal cycle. Um, and uh, we, we were, um, we kind of uncovered this tech or oral narrative uh, when we were studying um, the uh, cultural history of an area that uh, a large company wanted to turn into an open pit mine, and we found this is actually the place, the lake that was going to become uh, about 10, foot away from, 10 feet away from the tailings pond. And uh, we found that the, it, it seems like, you know, it's made up stuff around the water people and so forth, but it actually turns out that the uh, lake it's about 70 some feet deep, ha has a cleft and uh, there are aquifers that connect the lake to the water system in the Thompson River and in the Shushwap Lakes and uh, in the uh, South Thompson. So one final way of the manifestations of knowledge in ancient practice we wanted to uh, briefly discuss uh, just as one instance is the Suhuapmuk practice of landscape burning. Um, like other indigenous peoples, the Suhuapmuk have practiced landscape burning for thousands of years to manage forests, grasslands, and their intersections. Uh, so the, the landscape that Suhuapmuk people, into the generation of Ron's great grandparents, grandparents, even parents, lived in was not a wild landscape, but it was a 
carefully tended, managed landscape. The uh, rolling green hills that uh, the uh, surveyors and uh, explorers uh, coming into Sukhwatmokotluk notice were not wild rolling hills. They were managed by fire and by other ways of caretaking. And uh, burning, as we know from ethno-ecological studies, enables uh, the, it, it keeps the forest floor free of fuel and uh, kept the forests and grasslands open. It enabled reseeding and regrowth of tree species like lodgepole pine, which needs fire to regenerate. And it provided nutrients for herbaceous plants. So grasses, we know berry crops, crops do better uh, when you do periodic burning. Uh, we had in our, uh, for example, my great grandfather, that was his job to go out and, and, and uh, do a, uh, a look at the lay of the land and decide where there would be fires and you would set fires there for specific ob objectives, whether it's for uh, deer, deer, hab uh, deer habitat or for berries or medicinal plants or whatever the case may be. Uh, we also had different people that would go out and maintain our, our trails. Uh, there was another, other, one of my other uh, grandfathers, which would, that was his job. So we, each of us had different, each of our people had different tasks to carry out and manage our whole traditional territory that way. And uh, it's uh, an exact science of knowing which time of year to do it, to, uh, usually in our area in March, early April, when the ground is still moist so fires don't take off on you. Uh, we've also, uh, in practicing it, uh, come to learn that uh, it, it has to do with wind patterns. That time of year, in the morning, the wind will blow from one direction. About noon, it turns, blows back in the other direction, uh, likely due to uh, like temperatures and updrafts at that time. So you set your fire in the morning, and then it'll burn back the other way uh, after noon, and uh, you can make sure that uh, it doesn't take off on you. Um, of course, in the early decades of the 20th century, landscape burning was criminalized uh, in that uh, the uh, province began managing the forests for timber only, not for the understory, not for the water, uh, that are all, as we know, or they know now, uh, important parts of forest management. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, these pictures that you see here, I, I conducted an experiment uh, for 15 years of burning on this particular piece of land uh, in that fashion. And uh, I was able to get rid of uh, invasive uh, species like knapweed and the natural grasses came back. And two keystone plants uh, uh, that I hadn't known uh, for, last, for 100 years to grow there all of a sudden popped up. Uh, and one is, a one is a medicinal plant and the other is a food plant. So fire is a healer if used properly. Used properly is the key. <laughs> and uh, in our community and many other communities, indigenous and non-indigenous uh, throughout the interior, in 2017, we experienced the devastating imp impact of wildfires, uh, most notably the uh, huge Elephant Hill wildfire. And uh, so it's brought the uh, significance of landscape burning uh, back to the uh, attention of the uh, Ministry of Forests and uh, Scientists. So we uh, started doing some work together with uh, Professor Laurie Daniels, uh, who's uh, in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. And uh, she's done some very interesting uh, scientific work around measuring the uh, occurrence of past landscape burning. Uh, this particular project here, for uh, which she uh, uh, made a couple of her slides available, uh, is from the Southern Okanagan, but we're doing some similar uh, plots right now in, uh, in our area. And uh, so she set out to figure out what was the relative influence of human history, local topography, and climate in driving the historical fire regime among indigenous peoples in the interior. And 
how frequent and severe and variable were past fires? Were they human set? Were they natural fires uh, from lightning, from whatever kind of sources? How did past fires influence forest structure and composition? And so th this is what she found. Uh, basically, uh, she and her graduate students looked at uh, fire scars on some, more, uh, I think, over 200 trees in a given plot. Uh, this is near Okanagan Lake in this particular study. And uh, then they also did core sampling to uh, study the uh, uh, dendrochronology, but also the uh, thickness of the tree rings, which allowed them to determine if fires uh, had occurred that were otherwise in, in the scars on the tree, if they had occurred in the uh, spring or fall seasons, or if they had occurred uh, during the drier summer season. So they could uh, quite nicely uh, determine this and mark this out. And uh, the, uh, sort of the older trees, most of these were ponderosa pines, some of them uh, Douglas firs, uh, went back up to a few hundred years ago. And you see in those marks there that uh, the vast majority, something like 70 plus percent of fires occurred in the spring or fall season. And they were cooler fires. So they were human set fires that were part of the, the landscape management to keep the forest open to uh, burn fuel. And very few fires, in fact, that residue of 25 or so percent were the hot fires that were accidental, incidental fires in the summer season. And then if you look at sort of just to the right, uh, or th there's a, like a blank spot in the middle, and the year there is actually 1863 or thereabouts that put a stop to the landscape burning in that area. And there's a, th that's no coincidence, that was the year of the big smallpox epidemic in, uh, throughout BC and other areas that uh, killed two-thirds to three-quarter of the people in the area, and landscape burning stopped because there was nobody left alive to do it. It slowly resumed, but then throughout the 20th century, the uh, fires that were hot fires in summer, like the wildfires we've seen in recent years, have uh, become the prevalent kind of fires. And so you, you can see here with putting together uh, Western science of uh, forest ecology and looking at our own histories, looking at uh, the indigenous management regimes that we still know about from research, uh, we can actually take a really good look into the past. So in conclusion, we think that it's important to respect indigenous knowledge for its complex and detailed ways to communicate with landscape and land. Indigenous knowledge systems were oppressed through 150 years of dispossession from land, language, culture, and practices on the land. So Kwapmuk Indigenous Tlachamuil and the coming to our senses on the land, does not separate humans from landscape, resources, and their mutual impacts, but considers them as recipro recipro reciprocally and relationally connected and accountable to one another. And finally, indigenous knowledges should not stand in the shadow of Western knowledges. Thank you so much for this very thoughtful presentation, which really uh, emphasize the, the ways, the different forms of knowledges, but also uh, the way we come to know, the way we come to learn and pass knowledge. And the Sukukwek epistemology knowledge is based on experience, practice, reciprocity, and relationships to the land. It's also very much rooted in language and culture. Uh, so these are uh, absolutely uh, important reminders as we think about, uh, you know, new forms of knowledge such as artificial intelligence. Uh, the importance of uh, not ignoring but uh, celebrating indigenous knowledge as we also come to grasp with uh, important world problems. So for the sake of time, I'm going to turn to the question period. 
Um, you're invited to sh send your questions either through Slido or you can also stand up and come to the microphones to ask your question to our speakers. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Friki Kurosawa from York University. Uh, we spoke a bit yesterday, but I wanted to ask you about uh, landscape burning and uh, the gradual acquisition of knowledge about you know this, when it becomes a specific, uh, a very uh, precise science. And how was that? Uh, how long did that take for that to to develop uh, over the, the course of you know from the ancestors' knowledge being transmitted onto you? Um, was it trial and error over uh, several hundred years? Uh, was it something that was uh, more inductive or deductive in terms of the process? How did it, how did it go about? Um, well, I mean, this practice, we've, uh, our, our people have been carrying it on for uh, centuries. Uh, and, uh, but when I uh, was, it was illegal for us to, uh, to do burning. It was my great-grandfather last fire that he did, he went out into the bush with a magnifying glass, set it up in such a way that when the, the, the sun hit it at a right angle, it caught on fire and he rode off on his horse. And that was the last. Recently, I've been uh, lobbying the government and saying that we are taking this important tool bag. You have... Uh, lost the moral authority to manage the forest. As you can see, that it's run rampant with uh, infestations, uh, as well as now fires. And we are, and I'm picking up that practice. Unfortunately, the, uh, the knowledge, I didn't get the, the proper training that I should have, would have gotten had we practiced it. And uh, I'm just uh, experimenting. And uh, you have, uh, it's a science that you have to not only know the wind, but you need to know the atmospheric pressures uh, and uh, whether it's daytime, nighttime, you know, all of those, whether there's rain coming or you, you, or you burn, you look at the mountains, you see the snow and snow in the high mountains, so you'd burn up to the mountains, the fire would go out when it hit the snow, those different techniques and approaches so that it doesn't get away on you. I'm, it's a, I want to establish a, uh, a training program where we bring in experts, both indigenous and non-indigenous people, on, on the use of, of fire to manage the forest and train the next generation of, uh, of forest managers in that way. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, uh, we're just going to take one last question from the audience. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Can you share with us ways where local and traditional knowledge could be protected from uh, other people poaching it. So for instance, we know of the Mukurtu project, we know of some licensing projects from the Canadian Internet Public Policy Interest Clinic, but what would be the way to ensure that, that researchers going into your communities know how to attribute, know what they have rights to access and share, and also how to ensure as well that the collective knowledge of a community is protected across time and space. Thank you. Okay, big question, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think in the absence yet of indigenous intellectual property uh, protection in law, we need to just do the best due diligence that we can. and. Uh, one um, way that uh, we have practiced, uh, as we've discussed this with community members, elders, and among our colleagues, is uh, to basically put a declaration of intellectual property and uh, copyright into each one of the pieces that we public, publish and put out there. Um, it's also important uh, to, note that many of our communities have suffered uh, in the past from people appropriating knowledge uh, coming, uh, they can't the, we can't find the actual sources of recordings of whatnot. You, you saw the artifacts that were together with human remains that were stolen more than 100 years ago from our territory. 
And so there's a long legacy of grief and uh, of uh, disgust with uh, those acts of appropriation. And uh, so the, the reaction to that has been in many communities, well, we, we cannot disclose knowledge. Uh, we need to keep it locked up so outsiders can't steal it. And uh, at the same time, that kind of practice hasn't served us in protecting and bringing back our language and practices. Uh, our elders in the last few years in kind of rethinking that have, have told us quite strongly, no, we want our information to be out there. And uh, so that's where it's all the more important that we put that stamp of intellectual property on that information to protect it and detract others from taking it. Um, and uh, in terms of researchers, I think those of us who work in a community context, uh, context uh, seeing we work through the ethics uh, boards and eth uh, of, of our universities, let alone uh, through the uh, uh, ways in which Tri-Council protects us, you know, the, the interests of communities, um, it's more often nowadays past researchers who still bring us grief, who were not under those kind of guidelines and protections. And it's contract researchers who come in and uh, may feel they're not bound by those. So it's up to us in our communities to enforce and train and uh, protect that. And I don't know if Ron has something to say. Just uh, quickly, uh, yes, uh, in, in the 80s, uh, we uh, got together as a nation and we uh, made a resolution that if anyone is to come into the Shushwap Nation to conduct research, there's terms in which they, they, they can only utilize that for educational purposes. They cannot uh, publish it for profit uh, and that they'll have to turn over their notes to us back to us once they're finished so that we control and maintain that, uh, that knowledge. And because uh, our people uh, stated, as Marianne pointed out, that in not transmitting our knowledge or giving our knowledge, speaking about our knowledge, uh, our children have suffered as a result of it. And uh, our elders are now uh, saying, you know, it's too bad that we had to do things that way. So we get, we're working really hard to try to re-educate our, 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 our youth. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm sorry that we won't be able to take all the questions on Slido, but I feel that many elements of those questions were already addressed. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, so now we're turning to the next session, so I'd like to invite uh, moderators Pascal D'Angoisse and Philippe Rodrigue Rouleau to join us on stage. Alors, je vais, je vais les présenter. Ah, bonjour, voilà. Um, alors, la prochaine table ronde, donc, va être modérée par Pascal D'Angoisse et Philippe Rodrigue Rouleau. Pascal D'Angoisse est une doctorante au département de communication de l'Université d'Ottawa. Ses intérêts de recherche portent sur l'étude critique des communications politiques canadiennes, médiatisées ou non, sur tout ce qui touche au sujet du féminisme. Elle s'intéresse aussi aux mouvements sociaux et à l'activisme. Pourquoi et comment est-ce que les Canadiennes décident de participer ou non à un mouvement social et comment est-ce qu'un mou tel mouvement évolue? Pascal D'Angoisse est assistante de recherche également sous la direction de Constance Crompton pour le projet Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada. Et elle sera euh, en compagnie de Philippe Rodrigue Rouleau, qui est également candidat au, docteur, au doctorat en communication à l'Université d'Ottawa. Ses intérêts de recherche portent sur les mutations du journalisme, l'éthique et la déontologie journalistique, de même que sur la communication interpersonnelle. Depuis 2018, il enseigne au département de communication de l'Université d'Ottawa travaille comme assistante de recherche auprès de la professeure et vice-rectrice associée Martine Lagacé sur la question du vieillissement de la main dœuvre de l'AGIS et de la cohabitation intergénérationnelle en entreprise. Philippe a auparavant obtenu ses diplômes de baccalauréat de maîtrise à l'Université Laval et a étudié deux semestres à l'étranger à Edinburgh 
et à l'Université catholique de Louvain et les boursiers du Fonds de recherche du Québec, euh, FQRSC, de la, et un récipiendaire de la Bourse d'études supérieures de l'Ontario. Alors, je leur cède la parole pour la prochaine séance. Merci. Ça devrait? Ah oui, on, on m'entend très bien. Bonjour, est-ce que vous m'entendez? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. So, as she said, my name is Pascal D'Angoisse. Uh, first, we're honored. Uh, oh, no, actually, it's your turn to go. Ah, Please. my name is Philippe Rodriguez Rollo. So, I'm also a PG candidate, as, uh, as you know, from the University of Ottawa. Uh, ensemble, il nous fait vraiment plaisir de modérer uh, cette table ronde de ce matin pour le compte de la Société royale du Canada et euh, de l'Ambassade de France. Alors, cette discussion se déroulera dans les deux langues. Une traduction, comme vous le savez déjà, vous est offerte simultanément. On vous invite également à utiliser le hashtag euh, « Sommet G7 Ottawa » sur les réseaux sociaux et l'outil euh, « Slido » si vous voulez poser des questions. On essaiera de poser quelques-unes de ces questions-là à la fin de la présentation. Donc, la discussion de ce matin est intitulée « Dialogue intergénérationnel, les conséquences de l'intelligence artificielle » sur l'avenir du monde du travail, réunit, euh, on peut dire, trois personnes d'exception qui, euh, nous le croyons fortement, euh, vont nous nourrir une réflexion de haut niveau sur le thème euh, d'aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, laissez-nous vous les présenter. First, uh, we are honored to welcome Dr. Eilish Campbell, uh, Chief Trade Commissioner of Canada since 2017. In this role, Dr. Campbell is responsible for a team of hundreds of trade commissioners in 160 offices around the world who help ca Canadian firms sell, grow and go global. Auparavant, Dr. Campbell a été directrice générale à Finance Canada, en charge du budget fédéral pour les politiques, dont la politique en matière d'innovation et de défense. En outre, elle a été vice-présidente des politiques internationales et budgétaires au Conseil canadien des affaires, où elle s'est occupée des relations de chef de la direction avec la Chine, le Japon et l'Inde. Elle a commencé sa carrière dans la fonction publique fédérale canadienne en tant que négociatrice commerciale du cycle de Doha des négociations de l'OMC. Dr. Campbell holds a master's from the London School of Economics, and she and a doctorate in international relations from the University of Oxford. She is a designated uh, as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Nous sommes aussi uh, très heureux d'accueillir le professeur Olivier Faron, donc administrateur général du Conservatoire national des arts et métiers en France, le CNAM, et spécialiste des politiques d'enseignement supérieur, de recherche et de formation professionnelle. Donc, ancien élève de l'École normale supérieure de Saint-Cloud, agrégé et docteur en histoire, il a été, durant les années 80 et 90, chargé de recherche au Centre national de la recherche scientifique et directeur adjoint du programme dynamique urbaine de ce même CNRS. During the 2000s, he was professor at the universities of Lyon II and Paris IV Sorbonne and was appointed director of the École normale supérieure de lettres et sciences humaines in Fontenay-Saint-Cloud. In 2010-2011, he held the position of General Director of the École Normale in Lyon and that of Deputy Director of Higher Education for the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research in the years 2011 and 2012. Thank you. Finally, we are honored to welcome the economist and public policy expert, Sean Mullen. Mr. Mullen is the founding executive director of the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, whose multi disciplinary research team aims at advancing innovation policy in Canada. For more than a decade, Mr. Mullen has championed and shaped important public policy decisions with a particular focus on economic issues. Avant de rejoindre le Brookfield Institute, Mr. Mullen a occupé le poste de chef de cabinet au sein d'une société de financement par capitaux propres de Toronto, où il a travaillé pour les finances et la stratégie de gestion. Mr. Mullen a également conseillé pendant plus de six ans le premier ministre de l'Ontario et le ministre des Finances de l'Ontario. Il, uh, he also contributes to the public policy discourse in Canada and has frequently been published as an author, has contributed to reports, and was invited to speak on topics ranging from tax policy, infrastructure, clean technology, economic development, and innovation and entrepreneurship. Mr. Mullen has a degree in economics and computer science from the University of Toronto, an MA in economics from McGill, and an MBA from the University of Oxford. So we're all gathered here to this today to discuss the impacts of um, artificial intelligence and automation in the workplace. Of course, AI is far from new, but uh, it is uh, an inescapable dimension of, of, the work, of the workplace today, so much so that some people talk about the fourth industrial revolution uh, to describe a workplace that is increasingly 
uh, characterized by algorithms, self-automated tasks, self-learning, uh, problem-solving machines. Nevertheless, according to a recent survey by the specialized firm Robert Half, 60% of Canadians think that AI and automation will have a negligible impact nonetheless uh, on their job. Donc ma première question à vous tous pour commencer, est-ce qu'on est qu sous-estime un peu collectivement, les travailleurs, l'impact que va avoir et qu'a déjà l'intelligence artificielle euh, dans le monde du travail? Sean? Um, first of all, thank you for having me here and a pleasure to be, to be part of this group. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to look at you know, surveying the workforce and what their perceptions are versus potential impact. Um, I think this is one of these scenarios where uh, we are probably going to tend to overestimate the near-term impact of technological change, but probably underestimate the longer-term impact of technological change. And so what you're seeing is an extension of, uh, you know, from an economics perspective, which is the background I approach this, um, the substitution of labor for technology or capital, right? And this has been going on for arguably uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but what might be interesting, and I think is, is the crux of this question, is the set of technologies that have emerged over the last 10 years or so that we associate with the phrase artificial intelligence or machine learning, what tasks or what kind of capabilities have they unlocked that couldn't be done by machines before, that could only be done by humans? And um, if you look at the history of automation for 50, 60, 150 years since the um, Industrial Revolution, we've been good at taking kind of repetitive manual tasks uh, in manufacturing environments and others, uh, creating uh, technological solutions to them, and essentially uh, reducing the component of, of, of human labor, uh, largely to a, to a great outcome. I mean, higher productivity is how we raise uh, living standards. Um, what might be interesting, and what I think where a lot of the focus is now is these techniques we associate with artificial intelligence um, are, are higher order cognitive functions. Mm -hmm. um, there are things like pattern recognition, image recognition, um, that in and of themselves are, are quite interesting and have many applications, but when you start to piece them together, out of this you know, collection of tasks that humans do as part of their workforce, um, is there a whole category, um, largely service-based jobs or higher order cognition jobs, that um, are now at risk of being uh, uh, largely impacted? And, and, uh, and I think that's the real question um, and, and, uh, that we have to hit our heads around. Do we know Excuse what me. are the areas of work that are gonna be the most impacted by uh, automation and artificial intelligence? I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at the, the variety of different studies in this space, and, and our institute has, has done some of this work for Canada, uh, in the near term, you know, if you look at things like automation, it's still, it's still that um, repetitive manual type jobs, um, but in potentially different contexts. So what are jobs that are potentially at risk? Uh, accountants, uh, administrative assistants, um, uh, potentially retail sales jobs. Um, uh, these are large areas of employment, uh, truck drivers potentially, where those types of occupations can change drama dramatically. Um, but I think the most interesting way to think about it before I kind of turn it over to my colleagues is, is not at the occupation level, um, but rather breaking it into the task level, right? Because um, Will we ever completely take humans out of the transportation of our goods? Um, there will be the use of humans in some way, but it, it may change drastically. Similarly, let's take an accountant. Um, if you could do many and many of the tasks of accounting, automate them, you're still probably gonna need a human to provide advice, <coughs> to interpret those things. Um, and so what you're really doing is, is, is you're seeing these jobs and occupations change quite dramatically as opposed to being kind of completely eliminated or, or maintained in their same way. Thank you. Um, on that note, what infrastructures do you think are needed to enable a continuous and successful AI development within those tasks or the, those professions? It, this answer can go to anyone. Maybe Dr. Campbell? Yeah, sure. Premièrement, un grand, grand, grand merci à mes collègues de l'Ambassade du Canada uh, et aussi l'Ambassade de, de France uh, pour uh, cette conversation et aussi la Société royale du Canada. C'est excellent. C'est très intéressant d'être parmi vous. Um, I think it's also important that we're in a university setting because I'm sure that the answer to all of your questions 
uh, is going to require a deeply interdisciplinary focus and lots of conversation between the private sector, the public sector, government, regulators, um, and academics, bringing a multiplicity um, of perspectives on the challenges that we're talking about. Um, I think, you know, I'd fully agree with what John was saying about the, the task-related elements of this. Um, I was joking to my staff the other day, we had, a, we had a tough problem, and I said, you know, use your HI. And everyone was looking at me, and I said, yeah, your human intelligence. Um, so it's one thing to talk about artificial intelligence, and what's really powerful, um, speaking with many of our entrepreneurs um, and also academics in Canada, the United States, and across the G7, I mean, it's just how powerful some of the training modules are becoming. And what's really interesting when we talk about artificial intelligence as applied to communication, um, it, we're only, I think, about a year away from releasing software that essentially can mimic and create conversational content that sounds just like a person. Uh, and when you think about the implications for that on elections and media, how does the regulator step in when, in fact, you step in and just the simple act of finding the software to identify that first model actually helps train the original model. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question to understand where the regulatory systems may insert themselves into this. But I guess to answer your question specifically, I'd say three things. Um, the first is we need a population that's data literate. Um, I think we've really got to get much more serious about math and science education in Canada for our children. I'm a mother uh, of two small children. I'm very concerned um, about um, primary school math and science education. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay, but when I travel the world to Israel, Poland, Japan, Russia, and I see the equivalent um, primary school education, I'm, you know, I mean, the only tutor that my children have is a math tutor because I'm not satisfied with uh, how uh, the primary schools are keeping pace and just ensuring that no child falls behind. Uh, I'd say the second thing is, of course, data infrastructure. Um, and I'd invite those academics working in the computer science computing fields to, to provide their input to that conversation. Canada is sponsoring very large data backbones, the Canary Network, um, sponsoring additional uh, computing power, that's going to be really important. Um, and the third thing will be um, to enable what I think is the really positive vision of the future, which is people's lives being enabled and empowered by technology, including artificial intelligence uh, and the Internet of Things. We need a really solid 5G backbone that is not uh, yet rolled out in Canada, but we're working you know, incredibly hard on that. 5G is live already in parts of Korea. Um, it's going to launch soon in Japan. Um, it's a real challenge in a large country like Canada. So I think entering into national conversations, because we don't even have broadband effectively rolled out to all of our population, although, of course, most of the population does benefit from high-speed high broadband. But those kinds of questions, where we need to prioritize getting 5G is, is what I, I'd say the third piece. Monsieur Farron, je serais curieux donc vous entendre. Quel est l'avantage compétitif de la France dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle? Puis, vous pouvez peut-être peut nous parler des forces en ce moment en présence dans, dans, votre, dans votre pays. Merci beaucoup. À mon tour de, de remercier de, de, pour l'invitation à la fois l'ambassade de France, les, les académies. Je voudrais aussi rajouter, puisque dans mon CV, que j'ai la chance d'être docteur honoris causa de l'Université d'Ottawa. Donc, j'en suis, suis très fier quand je suis, quand je suis ici. Euh, alors, euh, les, forces, les forces compétitives de, de la France... Euh, C'est une question assez large. Je dirais que d'abord, hein, il, il y a eu une mobilisation politique assez forte euh, du gouvernement sur cette question-là. Il y a eu un plan euh, qui est piloté par euh, Cédric Villani, donc, euh, le député Cédric Villani, qui est sur l'intelligence artificielle. Et je suis d'autant plus heureux d'en parler qu'il a été annoncé au Conservatoire national des arts et métiers en présence d'Édouard Philippe, le Premier ministre. Alors... Les, les, les forces, je dirais, c'est la capacité probablement, comme, comme d'ailleurs le Canada, d'avoir un potentiel de recherche de très bon niveau, d'avoir un certain nombre de chercheurs dans les domaines à la fois de l'informatique, mais aussi des mathématiques, de la statistique, qui sont capables de, de se mobiliser. 
Et puis, je reviendrai quand même sur, si, si vous le permettez, sur les deux questions, enfin, sur la question quand même du monde du travail et comment euh, on doit aussi être capable de nous mobiliser pour répondre à ça. Euh, vous posiez la question sur la, sur la question de la... Est-ce qu'on a peur Est-ce que les citoyens ont peur de changer euh, D'abord, euh, et, et je suis très heureux aussi de parler dans un cadre au G7, on avait eu la chance euh, au CNAM d'accueillir euh, la société civile parlant au G7 en juillet, donc je pense que ces, ces moments de discussion sont essentiels. Je voudrais insister sur deux points. Le premier, c'est, euh, et c'est ce, ce que vous venez de dire, c'est voilà, beaucoup de, beaucoup de l'acceptabilité de l'intelligence artificielle, le mot-clé a été prononcé hier, c'est en termes d'éducation, de formation, d'intégration, donc... Voilà, à nous aussi de, de changer les lignes, à nous de faire comprendre, à nous d'attirer des publics qui ne sont pas forcément au fait de ces connaissances-là pour leur faire partager la chose. Donc ça, c'est le premier point. Et puis sur la question de comment l'intelligence artificielle impacte, par exemple, le monde du travail et comment il, enfin, il, est, il est perçu par ça, on assiste quand même à un, à un mouvement au U assez classique, c'est-à-dire que les besoins de l'intelligence artificielle, et là aussi je reviens à ce qui a été dit hier, c'est des besoins en données, des besoins en codage, donc des besoins voilà, qui, qui, euh, qui sont réels. Donc pour cela, voilà, on perçoit qu'on a besoin de codage, qu'on a besoin. Et puis au bout du U, euh, c'est des besoins d'analyse de, des données, de data scientist ou de faire des algorithmes. Et ces deux besoins-là, aujourd'hui, sont plutôt euh, réels, perçus, donc ça, ça, suscite, ça suscite des vocations. Je, je, je conclurai en disant que pour un pays, pour un vieux pays comme la France, euh, la question, elle est à la fois de faire que tout ce, toute cette agitation intellectuelle au sens positif du terme, tout ce progrès scientifique, toute cette mobilisation des chercheurs, des établissements d'enseignement supérieur de recherche, soit euh, mieux perçue donc, euh, et, et mieux compris de l'ensemble de la population. Donc il y a vraiment une question de capillarité de, de ce que nous faisons et ça c'est aujourd'hui un vrai enjeu c'est pour ça qu'un dialogue dans le cadre du G7 dont j'espère que voilà, on pourra diffuser largement les résultats est euh, un moment important Same question for, for you Mr. Mullen, uh, Dr. Campbell What is Canada's competitive edge in terms of artificial intelligence Do we have a niche in particular something that we can be particularly proud of Mr. Mullen um, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, first of all, and, and this won't be news to anyone in this room, but, uh, but you know, we here have been um, uh, the location for many uh, large and consequential breakthroughs uh, in this over the last 10 years. Um, some of the world leaders uh, in deep learning and artificial intelligence, uh, and this work has happened in Canada, and, it, and it's, it's one of those overnight successes that, that took 35, mm -hmm. 40 years of, of investment and foresight. Um, to get to. So uh, I, I think the more we can continue to support uh, that type of activity uh, uh, is really one of the only ways um, that we compete now that you know, large nation states like China and the United States and others are, are pouring in uh, literally billions and billions of dollars on this. The other thing I would, I would say is just um, you know, having a, a talented workforce, um, an open society, Um, and, uh, and maybe the way um, that, uh, that our two countries are, are kind of dealing, even a forum like this, where we're thinking about this not as a strictly technological problem, but how it fits in with broader public policy and society issues. Mm -hmm. I think we could potentially have that become a competitive advantage um, and to see how the application of this technology uh, to a much broader set of um, societal benefits and you know, avoiding, avoiding harms Um, could be something that, um, that Canada and France, excuse me, together uh, uh, use to their long-term advantage. Dr. Campbell, quickly on this. Yeah, so, so let me tell you in like 20 seconds, the typical story of, of economic development in Canada, which is we punch way above our weight in the R&D phase uh, of economic sector development And we are really great at starting companies. Canada has one of the easiest places to start businesses, so that's great. And then we fail on the mass scale commercialization and prosecuting large companies. And there's no reason that that has to continue, none at all. So I think 
uh, seeing venture capital come into Canada with much more intention. Now we have to have more growth capital. We have to look to our financial institutions. We have very well capitalized banks in Canada. Uh, seeing them participate more uh, in the growth phase of capital would be awesome. And I would say uh, the visa and skills and trained Canadians piece that Sean was talking about, we are able to attract the world to Canada. Part of that is because Canada, and it's really thanks to everyone in this room, every day I'm so blown away. I love coming home when I travel because people here are deeply, truly respectful of one another. Uh, we have work to do, we always have work to do, and I recognize our Indigenous colleagues that spoke before us. We have a lot more work to do on reconciliation, but I think we're on the path and we have to keep going. Um, that's not the case in many places that I travel. Part of this is Canada's great brand internationally. Part of it is, frankly, the United States really scaring, you know, I would say people uh, who can't renew their HB1 uh, visas. Uh, we're attracting engineers from around the world in numbers, frankly, that we weren't before. But my last point would be, you know, do look at the numbers in terms of patents related to AI um, and academic papers internationally. The US and China still vastly exponentially outnumber us, even when you control for population size. So let's say they were smaller or we were bigger. Um, it just means we have to be all the more intentional about our work. And I'm thrilled uh, about some of the investments in innovation infrastructure, particularly the pan-Canadian uh, strategy on AI. I tip my hat repeatedly to Alan Bernstein and the entire CIFAR team, uh, to Sean's point, who really seeded this work uh, quite some time ago. But I'm excited about investing in innovation, the innovation parts of the ecosystem that bring business demand and our researchers together, the Vector Institute in Toronto, our work in Montreal, the Superclusters Initiative, this kind of experimentation at a larger scale with a lot more intention, capital focused and problem solving is essential if we're gonna keep that AI advantage that Canada has. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, on va passer sur un autre thème. Je crois que c'est un thème qui va vraiment vous parler euh, aux trois en même temps. Donc, un rapport euh, de la Banque RBC de 2018 indique que plus de 50 des emplois canadiens seront affectés d'une manière ou d'une autre par l'intelligence artificielle dans les prochains dix ans, ce qui va un peu dans le sens du rapport du, de l'Institut euh, Brookfield, de M. Mullen, qui parlait en 2016 de plus de 40 des tâches de travail qui pourraient être remplacées par l'automatisation et l'intelligence artificielle. Euh, le rapport indique aussi qu'il y, qu y aura sûrement plus d'emplois dans le futur et non pas moins. Or, ce sont les compétences professionnelles exigées qui vont être en profonde transformation. Alors, Dr. Campbell, vous l'avez mentionné un petit peu, c'est les mathématiques, les sciences. Il va falloir euh, en discuter. Monsieur euh, Farron, en tant qu'administrateur qu général du CNAM, ça pourrait être intéressant aussi d'avoir euh, votre réponse. Et puis, on vient de, de noter votre, votre rapport euh, de Brookfield Institute. Donc, on, on pourrait essayer d'avoir une petite discussion euh, après l'autre, à, à propos de ça. Peut-être sur, sur... Effectivement, la, la, la question centrale devient vraiment celle de la, de la compétence, c'est-à-dire quelles sont les compétences et comment on peut découper euh, les, les enjeux qui sont les enjeux professionnels et, et expliquer, imaginer les, les compétences qu'il faudra avoir pour, pour répondre à ces enjeux professionnels. Après, euh, la, question, euh, la question centrale, c'est effectivement comment, euh, en définitive, on, lien, on lit cette question de nécessité de la professionnalisation et de l'évolution de l'ensemble du système de formation. Donc ça, c'est une question qui, évidemment, euh, engage, engage beaucoup. Je dirais que les, les réponses qu'on peut apporter, euh, c'est d'abord une attention sur euh, une acculturation forte, euh, très en amont des populations qui restent encore un peu éloignées du numérique. Donc, euh, il y a beaucoup d'actions assez significatives pour réussir cela. Après, la, le deuxième temps, c'est véritablement, et là, en ce sens-là, l'intelligence artificielle est à la fois quelque chose à apprendre, mais quelque chose qui permet aussi de progresser dans le former, dans la manière d'apprendre. Et on voit un peu un côté, d'ailleurs, c'est assez intéressant, un peu Dr. Jekyll et Mr. Hyde, parce qu'il y a un côté, euh, l'intelligence artificielle, notamment dans certains pays d'Asie, qui est devient une espèce d'arme pour contrôler les apprenants. Vous faites même de la reconnaissance faciale, vous regardez si l'apprenant suit ou ne suit pas. Il y a des systèmes qui sont quand même assez lourds d'enjeux. A contrario, et des expériences sont de plus en plus positives sur cela, si l'intelligence artificielle est utilisée, j'allais dire à la fois pour permettre une réussite des meilleurs 
et un bon accompagnement de ceux qui ont des difficultés, ça devient un formidable outil. Pourquoi ça devient un formidable outil D'abord parce que ça permet à l'enseignant lui-même d'avoir de nouveaux dispositifs pour se rendre compte de ce qui marche et de ce qui ne marche pas. Et puis surtout, ça permet que des potentialités puissent s'exprimer. Et en cela, c'est ce qui est assez, assez frappant, notamment quand on parle de toutes ces nouvelles sphères, réussir dans le numérique, réussir dans l'intelligence, enfin, aller vers l'intelligence artificielle c'est que c'est souvent quelque chose qui est relativement contradictoire avec des parcours scolaires classiques. Donc, il y a cette question de repérer les, 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 les bonnes potentialités, de repérer aussi la bonne motivation. Un exemple qui a été porté en France sur notamment le codage numérique a été porté par un des grands patrons du numérique français qui a fait remarquer que celle qui lui a permis d'inventer une box, enfin un outil numérique important, était quelqu'un qui était totalement orthogonal avec le système scolaire classique. Donc, on peut imaginer qu'il y ait des capacités, grâce à l'intelligence artificielle, de mieux reconnaître l'ensemble des potentiels et en même temps, et je finirai sur quand même un côté Mr Hyde, malgré tout, la fonction de l'enseignant, la médiation par l'enseignant, reste le véritable enjeu, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut que le système soit, malgré tout, totalement maîtrisé. Une phrase pour conclure, euh, euh, il y a aussi ce rêve, et c'est un peu la suppression, il n'y a plus d'emploi et autres. Nous, on a fait des études sur des potentiels qui suivent nos formations. Si vous prenez du tout numérique, du tout présentiel, ce qui marche le mieux à chaque fois, c'est l'hybride, c'est-à-dire du numérique et du présentiel ce qui est une grande leçon pour les professeurs de la Sorbonne comme moi, parce que ça veut bien dire qu'il faut qu'ils utilisent le numérique, mais c'est aussi une leçon pour ceux qui pensent que le tout numérique répondra à tout. Donc la vérité, elle est dans une médiation enseignante repensée, et ça, je crois que c'est un enjeu important aussi. Dr. Campbell, vous avez touché sur le sujet earlier, mais est-ce que la workforce jeune, celle qui est entrée dans la workforce à présent, est-ce suffisamment préparée pour cette économie d'intelligence artificielle Could I actually cede my time to Sean? I think you've, you and your institute have actually studied that very topic. Um, well, thank you. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe just one um, contextual piece, and then I'll, 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 I'll answer that in, in more general. But I think, you know, I, I think it's important to kind of take a big picture view on the jobs and disruption piece, because um, there's a lot of work out there that kind of paints, uh, you know, a bleak uh, potential dystopian future. And, and we've looked at vulnerabilities of existing, um, existing occupations uh, as an institute ourselves. And there certainly are areas uh, of the workforce that are at risk. But there's kind of an inherent bias in this type of work because you're looking at existing jobs and you're mm -hmm. saying, okay, where are their vulnerabilities? But what's much, much harder is to envision the jobs that technology itself creates. And, um, and so if you kind of look back and use, say, the internal combustion engine 150 years ago as an example, you could look around and say, well, okay, um, you know, uh, blacksmiths, uh, horse, and, uh, uh, horse and saddle workers, stage coaches, these types of jobs are definitely going to be at risk. And you might, have, you might have been really thoughtful and said, well, okay, but there's going to be cars and people are going to have to service them, so those, those are going to be jobs as well. And maybe you could envision the highway network and all this type of stuff. But would you have really envisioned the airplane industry mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the jobs in assembling uh, airplane, uh, the, the, you know, running airports, uh, and the demand associated with transportation has essentially uh, grown exponentially because of the introduction of this technology. So it did have a, a disruptive impact. Um, Certainly, and it and it impacted jobs uh, that were existing in 1880. But um, if you're kind of betting on a jobless future, you're essentially betting against human ingenuity, uh, human creativity, mm -hmm. and long-term demand uh, of humanity. And and historic is all histo histo history has always kind of shown that people keep demanding new stuff, yeah. new services, and so we'll figure out a way how to do it. So so my kind of answer to this is I'm long-term optimistic. But the challenge might be um, how to get there. Do we, you know, it, it is possible you could have disruption happen so quickly 
that you disrupt large swaths of existing populations and you lose um, some of the political compact or support in order to kind of support this technology and it becomes a bit of a backlash. So I think two things we need to do to prepare our workforce is, is one, you know, the skills and technology, uh, uh, use of technology, uh, basic underlying uh, skill sets like math and, and STEM. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, if, if you look at the, the resilience of workers who, whose jobs may be changing, um, it's very much associated with soft skills, interpersonal skills, uh, being able to work in teams, uh, being able to uh, exercise judgment. And those are the types of skill sets that are gonna be much more resilient to technological change. And so if we can do that, I think we prepare the next generation. And then what we have to think about is, okay, what about people who are in the middle of their careers and who may see, you know, I'm not saying this might happen, but it's possible the trucking industry could just be eliminated in 15 years. And that's 300,000 workers across Canada, a very good middle class job. Um, you don't want someone who's 30 to be completely unemployed when they're 45. So I think we need to think about both preparing the next generation, but what are the pockets of vulnerability in our existing uh, workforce? And how do we make sure that we're uh, training, upskilling, retraining those types of people into jobs where there's gonna be in increased demand as we go forward? Um, actually, we have a question on the screen, wh which I think is quite appropriate for the current conversation. So if you don't mind, we'll actually skip ahead and and read it out. So why should math and science be a focus for the future and not a STEM approach, a STEAM approach? Wouldn't you agree that the humanities and social sciences are key to managing the challenges of AI, science, trust, and democracy? So the short answer is absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's all of the above, absolutely. Um, and it's ethicists and it's going to be uh, people who are able to enter into the kind of uh, conversations that Sean was just describing, but I think it's really important in Canada that we focus back on some key data points, which are that our children are performing far better on literacy and communication, both in English and in French, than they are in science and math results. So we're hitting it out of the park on reading, and uh, you know, I'd invite anyone to, to give me the actual number, but the last time I checked, it was only 60% of grade six students who are meeting the provincial standard in math. So that really concerns me. So while I'm, fo you know, my remarks earlier focused on math, it's because I think through a whole bunch of effort, we really cracked the nut on youth literacy. And I think our early childhood education policies, uh, which the OECD has focused on, you know, getting more children into really good quality daycares, nursery schools, enabling moms who, and, and fathers, of course, who wanna look after their children at home, uh, to be going to literacy programs at their local libraries, we've done it. Now we need to have a national conversation on science and math. And I, I actually think, I think we have an incredible backbone. And I would, I would also say that includes indigenous uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge and science. We have it all here. Uh, and and let's, uh, let's make the most of it. And I would, uh, you know, I think it's a great conversation for the G7, if you'll allow me. Um, two key themes continued between the Canadian presidency of the G7 and the French. Uh, one was on uh, the women's uh, economic and social empowerment, the Gender Advisory Council to um, the Prime Minister continued under President Macron, uh, for which I say uh, un grand, grand, grand chapeau. Um, and the second was this conversation on AI. Now, as the US takes over the G7 presidency, I'm sure at least we can keep AI. Uh, on the agenda, and the rest of us are all just gonna keep going on these other integral conversations. But each one of us, let's get a math and science conversation going in our own communities, uh, and using the resources of the U of O uh, out to Ottawa uh, area students. I mean, I know we can crack this. I don't think it's hard. Uh, Do you have anything to, to add to pour, uh, D'abord pour me féliciter, parce que c'est, on ne l'a pas dit de, de ce que vous venez de dire, me féliciter aussi, je voudrais prendre cet exemple-là de d'avoir deux modérateurs qui soient des, des doctorants. Oui. En France, ça serait, ça, ça serait relativement compliqué. Pourquoi je dis ça Parce que... C'est parce que, toujours plus complexe. C'est toujours plus compliqué. Pourquoi je prends cet exemple-là Et ça rejoint la question sur les sciences humaines et sociales, parce qu'on euh, a fait un gros travail en France la dernière année pour que le doctorat soit reconnu comme un titre professionnel. Ah, voilà. Donc, à côté des connaissances, et c'est très important de dire évidemment que moi, je viens des sciences humaines et sociales, ça a été rappelé, je suis historien, donc évidemment, les sciences humaines et sociales doivent peser, ont un rôle, 
Et si on n'est pas totalement dans une position ancillaire avec les sciences exactes, ce qui peut arriver, c'est évidemment central. Mais aussi parce que quand on fait un niveau de formation, et je prends l'exemple du doctorat, on acquiert des connaissances, dans vos cas, dans le domaine de la communication, mais on acquiert aussi des compétences, on acquiert des soft skills, on acquiert une capacité à manager des projets, une capacité, et ça, sur tout ce qui va se créer dans une économie nouvelle, entre guillemets, c'est absolument essentiel. On apprend, à les, les, parce que vous parliez de quelles sont les qualités respectives des différents pays, je pense que Canada comme France, on a aussi des générations de jeunes entrepreneurs, on a oui. des générations de start qui oui. sont... Bon. Pour faire réussir une start-up, il faut avoir aussi et beaucoup des soft skills, des compétences, et, et c'est très important. Et je pense que, voilà, au-delà des disciplines, ce qui est important, c'est ce type d'apprentissage-là. Uh, we know that some individuals are like historically left out or excluded from lifelong learning or training opportunities. I'm, I'm thinking of older workers independent workers, minorities, even women. Um, how can we ensure that these people are not excluded uh, moving forward in this economy of artificial intelligence? Si Monsieur Parent? Si je peux juste enchaîner, parce que il est malheureusement pas là sur un exemple qui est assez frappant. Donc, je vais reparler des gilets jaunes, parce qu'Antoine Petit en euh, a parlé hier. Euh, pour moi, les gilets jaunes, ça se résume pas. Antoine a résumé en disant c'est euh, un délai euh, entre... En gros, si on passe de 90 km h à 80 km h on perd une, heure et demie, une minute et demie. Et on ne comprend pas pourquoi les Gilets jaunes font ça. Les Gilets jaunes, c'est un très bon résumé de la question que vous, voulez poser, que vous venez de poser. C'est-à-dire que tout ce qu'on raconte sur ces économies-là, ce sont des économies totalement métropolitaines. Ce sont des économies... Et la, et, et, et la formation professionnelle en France, par exemple, je prends l'exemple de la France, il faut être un homme occidentale, 45 ans, travailler dans une entreprise du CAC 40, dans une plus grosse entreprise. Donc, vous êtes déjà super formé, super inséré, et vous recevez la formation. Donc, ce, ce, cette question-là de faire comment vous sortez et comment vous, vous allez vers euh, des, des, des citoyennes et citoyens éloignés de ces formations, éloignés de ces questions, éloignés même de, dirais, de l'appétence pour ces questions-là, c'est, en tout cas en France, la question absolument majeure qui nous est rappelée tous les samedis. Demain, c'est samedi, on va rentrer pour voir de nouveau les Gilets jaunes. Donc, c'est une question qui est absolument centrale. Et encore une fois, je reprends ce que je disais tout à l'heure, elle commence très tôt parce que euh, vous avez... Euh, alors, nous, on situe à 15 à 20 euh, la population totalement éloignée du numérique. Et on, on, la ministre l'a annoncé la semaine dernière, il y a 1,3 million de jeunes qui n'ont pas de qualification, pas d'emploi, pas de certification et qui sont totalement sans, sans, voilà, sans situation fixe. En l'occurrence, et c'est pour ça que je reviens sur ce que je disais tout à l'heure, l'intelligence artificielle, dont, euh, avec les doubles aspects, notamment la question des données et autres, peut être euh, aussi, si elle est bien construite, une opportunité pour euh, essayer, en tout cas, de préparer ces populations-là. Avant qu'on passe au dernier thème de notre discussion, est-ce que Dr. Campbell ou M. Marlon, vous aviez quelque chose à ajouter sur l'idée de ne pas exclure certaines personnes dans cette euh, évolution? Uh, just maybe a quick point on, on, on your last question. Sure. One dimension, I think, that's really important is, is, the, is the age dimension, right? And so if you, if you, this may or may not be true, but if you make the assumption that um, some of this disruption is happening faster, You know, in previous generations, if you look at you know the transition from an agriculture-based uh, workforce to a manufacturing-based workforce, that happened over generations, and so you really weren't retraining people in the middle of their careers. It was the children of the farmers who then got educated to go into the manufacturing economy and, and vice versa. And so, at least in Canada, we don't have an infrastructure for retraining mid-career people. I mean. Our entire education system from K to 12 into post-secondary is, is based on that first third or 20% of your life, 25% of your life. And so if that becomes a, the societal challenge now, uh, depending on what level of disruption is happening, um, I don't think we can just do this incrementally and just take existing uh, techniques uh, Uh, and extend it to people in their 40s and 50s. We need to work back and say, well, wh what are the challenges facing these type of people? They have families, they have, they want to usually, you know, 
ideally you're retraining before you lose your job, so you're trying to do that uh, together. Um, and how are we designing our programs uh, in order to, to meet these goals instead of just kind of incrementally extending our infrastructure that, that we have to date? Um, yeah, I would just say uh, two quick things. Um, the first is um, that all institutions need to recognize their bias. You know, to, to, to just have a frank assessment if they need help with that, to, to just name it uh, and really listen uh, not only to people that they have as clients or those Canadians that they're serving, but find out who they're not serving. This isn't about taking chairs away from the table. It's about adding them. So I don't know if I have, I think, um, uh, Christine or any other, are there any trade commissioners in the room? If you could put your hand up. Um, we, I think I have one member of our team uh, who's here. Uh, we're here uh, for any conversations with anyone that uh, wants to enter into um, entrepreneurship, international sales, exporting. Uh, we've really taken a hard look. We had a Business Women in International Trade program, uh, but we've invited our minority-owned businesses to work with us on improved services, and we now have uh, working with the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business, a specific business line for Aboriginal businesses, um, and we're open to constant improvement. I don't know if I have any colleagues here from the Treasury Board Secretariat. If you're in the room, uh, I think it's really important that more Canadians know about the um, AI and the algorithmic impact assessment. Canada has launched an assessment, a risk assessment framework for all uh, algorithmic-based or AI services. It's a pilot. We're trying to figure out how we can best do a risk assessment that includes issues around any um, data-based bias in the information being fed into uh, procurement that the Government of Canada may have. Uh, we're looking at, um, you know, AI isn't uh, kind of transparent or easily accessible the same way uh, perhaps a contract could be, but we're looking uh, at various ways to test uh, again, for bias uh, and assess various forms of transparency. Um, so please do take a look at the algorithmic uh, impact assessment and we're collaborating with the OECD uh, and, and, and many others, uh, I'm sure as, as time goes on and over to improve that tool and I'm sure there'll be many others uh, through our global collaboration with, uh, with France and other global partners um, on um, AI ethics institutes uh, and our work kind of globally uh, on these issues. That's why the G7 is uh, an important forum, as is the G20, for these conversations. Um, so we've been told that it's, it's time to cut it off. So we'll take maybe one last question that's on the slide, yeah? Okay, so the question is, improving and adapting education has been, has been a theme throughout this discussion. Can we rely on the public system to educate people for resilience against technological disruption, or do other institutions, such as businesses, have obligations? So I think, any one of you three could actually answer the question as you wish. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, I think um, the public education system always has to be the core, right? It's the way we get, uh, we promote accessibility and we, we reach the, the vast majority of our, of our population. And yet, and there's a project we're, we're working on right now about digital competencies and, 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 and youth and kind of getting them into the system and, and getting them interested in this earlier. And um, what, it, what it is is a reflection of, you know, the rate of change in our public education system is, is not very fast. And in some ways that's good. You don't want to be changing the curriculum all the time. But technology tends to, to move faster. So how can we graft on, how can we make relationships with business or community groups um, um, or NGOs, nonprofits, others, uh, universities even, um, to try and ensure that what we need to know and what our youth need to know um, is staying current and then have that and create a feedback mechanism so that that can go back and, and get adopted back into the public education system. I think that's really the only way to deal with, with a question like this in a systematic way. Sur la, la question est importante sur le mot, évidemment, euh, institution publique. Le débat hier, euh, qui était très intéressant sur le rôle des académies, le montre bien comment les institutions publiques ont, un, je dirais, un rôle central à, à, à porter. Moi, j'en prends un exemple qui est assez frappant sur euh, tout ce qui est responsabilité sociétale et environnementale, qui est, qui est un thème évidemment central. Ce qui est assez, le paradoxe qui est assez fort, par exemple, dans un pays comme la France, c'est que on a commencé à dire euh, la responsabilité sociétale et, entrepreneur et environnementale, c'est pour les entreprises. 
Je pense que dans des discussions comme celle justement dans un cadre G7, ça serait intéressant qu'on élargisse ça et on dise qui porte ça. Et voilà, bon, je suis responsable d'une grosse institution publique, donc ça serait bien aussi qu'on ait et qu'on rende des comptes et que, notamment quand il y a, je prends l'exemple, et vous soulignez l'importance du, du dialogue Canada-France entre institutions, entre universités canadiennes et françaises, pourquoi ne pas faire un volet oui. systématique en disant, voilà une proposition, en disant, eh bien, dans, quand il y a une coopération, au lieu de dire on échange des étudiants, ce qui est important, on échange des chercheurs, on fait des programmes, pourquoi pas dire qu'est-ce que vous faites pour la responsabilité sociétale et environnementale je voudrais juste dire que l'une des caractéristiques les plus frappantes des établissements d'enseignement supérieur français, c'est que probablement ce sont les pires en termes environnementaux. Pas simplement de notre faute, hein, mais parce qu'on a des vieux locaux. Enfin bon. Mais voilà, dire, qu -ce que, en gros, comment vous construisez euh, cet avenir-là Comment vous répondez à cette question sur sensibiliser l'ensemble euh, et, et assurer la culture scientifique et technique Je pense qu'on voilà, pourrait imaginer un, une proposition de ce type. Quoi. Maintenant, quelques questions. On a Je quelques questions aussi sur le slide d'eau. On n'a pas le temps. <rire> donc, on va, on va donner donc une chaleureuse main d'applaudissement à Sean Mullen, Olivier Farron, Eilish Campbell. Merci infiniment. Merci pour leur présence. Oui, merci. Bonne, bonne journée. Merci beaucoup aux, aux panélistes et à nos modérateurs pour un panel très, vraiment très intéressant. On va prendre une très courte pause de 8 à 10 minutes maximum et au retour, on accueille notre conseillère scientifique en chèque, Mona Mémère. Merci. <rires>